So, literally, well, we'll open with this. So, hello everyone, welcome back. I'm reading at the moment about uh, Tolkien's descendants. First thing that's notable with them, literally every one of them, even the women, has the surname Rule, R-E-U-L, in addition to their other surnames, like their other middle names. Oh. Literally every one of them. Tolkien's parents had it, Tolkien had it, all of his kids have Rule as a surname, and then it, as a middle name, and then it goes from there. He has a grandson called Royd Tolkien, um, <laughs> who was okay. in most of the Peter Jackson films. Oh. But this is the one that just did, did absolutely threw me, is that this is... Um, so this is just completely unrelated, but Christopher Tolkien's wife was called Faith Falconbridge, which is a fucking fantastic what? That's name. a comic book level name. She did not change her name to Tolkien when she married Christopher Tolkien, because quite, quite frankly, right. even Faith, for a name Faith as famous Falcon as Tolkien, Bridge. you can't be giving up a name like Falconbridge that easily. You can't make that up. That, that's incredible. It's like how, you know, uh, the Arctic Explorer... Um, Robert Falcon Scott. His middle name was actually He's Falcon. Falcon. <laughs> he was Captain Falcon, like in F-Zero. Oh, I love it. It's kind of cool that like his ship is actually based in the city of Dundee. That's where he like began his voyage from, the city that oh, I currently I currently live in. Did you not know that? Yeah. No, I know, I know a lot about him because like his ship. I've is literally the like, only place in Dundee I've ever been to has been your old house and your current house. I don't. I've never actually meaningfully been to Dundee. Well, like, his his ship that he undertook his first antarctic voyage on like the discovery is actually in Dundee. That's where he's as in off the from. the actual ship. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Like I'm, I'm, I'm organ This is kind of cool, actually. I'm organizing a conference. Like uh, that's why I, some of what I do for a job is organize conferences. And I'm gonna get to have de like um, drinks on the deck of the ship that's actually been to the South Pole. That's really cool. But it's like, did a, you see a thing recently of of um, Shackleton's ship being found, the Endeavour? I can top that actually. I not only did I see it, there's, there's a, a friend of a friend who was part of that expedition. Oh, nice. So, like, um, there's a friend of mine who, she under, she's undertaking her PhD in Iceland in, like, marine studies. And someone oh, who's a friend of hers on her course was actually a member of the expedition that found Shackleton's ship. That's well cool. Like, that was, when I was reading about that, it's like, it is one of, like, the perfect cases. Because the weird thing is, because of the conditions, they can't get, like, live video feed from the, like, the probes they send down. They basically have to send them down to look around and then look at the video when it comes back up. And then one of the probes came up and they were like, oh, we think it's found it. They looked at the video footage, and literally the first thing you see is swimming out of the darkness is the back of the ship, and it just says, ENDEAVOR in huge letters <laughs> over the front of the, like, holy shit, <laughs> like, there could not be a clearer sign that we fucking found it. It was so cool. That's just, it is really cool. It, it's awesome to a level. And it's obviously like, perfectly preserved, because it's been, you know, three kilometers below the Antarctic for yeah. the best part of a century. Absolutely. That's a really, it's, 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 these are both awesome stories, but Robert, Captain... Sorry, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and Ernst Shackleton. Shackleton actually served on the Discovery, I'm pretty sure. I thought the two were kind of related, which is why I kind of segued into Shackleton a bit there, yeah. I'm pretty sure that Shackleton, like, who is Irish, like, but again, a, a famous explorer in his own right, I'm pretty sure that he served with Scott on the I, first, I always the got the impression that, like, most big Antarctic explorers probably knew each other. Yeah. It's not exactly a huge pool, is it? I think we might have talked about this on the channel before, viewership, but Robert Falcon Scott was like a, a British explorer who tried to be the first man to the South Pole, but like he made the great mistake of there was another group of explorers that were trying to make it to the South Pole before him, and those explorers were Scandinavian, and he thought, <laughs> yeah, I, I can beat Scandinavians in a polar environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Roald Amundsen. Yeah, there, there's a lot of criticisms of Scott's voyage, but like, um, it, there's a lot of cool things about it as well, but that's not what we're here to discuss. Why are we here to discuss, Doctor? Apparently you're going to hamstring this We're here to, to this hamstring rancor. this growl, and we've made it bleed, and that's hopefully going to attract Karagors, and we want that for some reason. I don't know. Well, I'm listening to this dwarf, and it seems like we've made a series of bad decisions, frankly. I, I, so I don't think that's a growl. You're fighting a rancor, and I refuse to accept anything else. <laughs> now you've got to well, mount Now I need Karagor. to learn what I did and mount a Karagor, yeah. Alright, where are these caragors at? Hello. Oh shit, they're right here. Fuck I mean, at least this mission makes structural sense in that, like, the dwarf taught us how to, like, ride a caragor, yes! and now you're riding a caragor. I mean, am I, though? I mean, you're getting your ass kicked right now. Come on, come on. Ah, fucking Christ, get the fuck up. I was gonna say, if this caragor gets, like, a fucking name for killing me, this is like, ah, this is Gorthung the caragor, or some bullshit. 
I think there we go. He's knocked this one unconscious. So let's 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 go for it. Oh shit! No, no. Uh, Kiwi there stump. we go. There we go. Now you're on a category. Right, let's dominate this guy. Yoink! Now, in the last episode of Viewership, we did a little bit of research. The Doctor looked up Tolkien's family, and I tried to figure out why it is that in fantasy universes like the Lord of the Rings and various other like properties, why it is that dwarfs are always Scottish. It's never actually occurred to me to work this out before, so I guess thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> but like, I found an article on, and I'll, I'll quote it to you so that you can look it up in your own time, because it is quite I don't want to cut over you, but we just had a fantastic line of the guy going, I fought bigger grogs than you when I was a wee boy and my beard was only three inches long, which was <laughs> fantastic. So this, I'm quoting an article now from a site called Atlas Obscura. Oh yeah. It's written by a chap called Eric Grundhauser, which is a great name. That is a great name. But um, he seems to think that because like lots of these productions were in the UK initially, so like initial recordings of Lord of the Rings and similar fantasy movies were like largely shot, made, cast in the UK. And you cast English actors as elves and like kings yeah. and roy royalty to contrast that and to kind of tease out the fact that these were good honest hard-working people but were also English speakers and therefore good you used Welsh and Scottish actors to kind of drive on a Celtic thing yeah and, th and that's that my cult uh, which is not that sounds not great but makes sense yeah it, there's there's worse things I guess we, we can sorry what that was the whole point of this was to ride a growl Wow. Why, though? Yeah, we'll, we'll get that, I guess. Oh, quick time events. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. That old chestnut. <laughs> I remember some... Oh, what the fuck? There we go. I remember a friend of mine giving me shit for, like... It was the end of Halo 4 that has, like, quick time events, and he was like, I hate this game. You literally press buttons to defeat the final boss. And I was like, arguably you do that in any game, but I take your points. Um, it makes me a little bit unhappy that this game, which thus far has the really innovative narrative and nemesis system that lets you forge your own path through the game, and every, every path is unique, and it's different for every player, blah, 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 which has been really cool and interesting so far, and now we're doing quick time events. I mean, but we've always had that with the, what's it called, like, with the the things you do to avoid death, um, like the, the last chance things. I mean, that that's a mechanic within... But it's still a quick time event thing. Yeah, that, that is. You know what? Yeah, that's true. I accept your point. This is just a rancor. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, these, as we looked up last time, these are not a thing in Tolkien lore. No, uh, Tolkien did not conceive of a creature that lives beneath Java's palace. Kulara <laughs> Kista! Kulara Kulta! Yeah. I genuinely uh, don't know if that was, like, uh, Hutties or just Finnish. No, you, it could be either. A <laughs> little bit of both. Oh, can I just kill him? Oh, we're just gonna hemorrhage him. Oh, no, shit, wait, get back on. Back on the ground. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Right, you, you trigger fuck, you and me, not right bumper. Let's just do his brain in. There we go. Oh, I feel that... Uh, oh, we're not gonna get a sad death like the cave troll in Moria, where it's like, yeah, you shouldn't feel great about this. He was just a poor, innocent creature. Shit. Uh, I still don't feel great with this. It's one of my favourite scenes. Well, not one of my favourite scenes, but I really like the way the cave troll is portrayed. And, like, Christopher ja Not Christopher Jackson. Peter Jackson talks about this um, when he talks about, like, the scene, like, the music and all the directorial choices that are made, like, when the cave troll dies. That they basically said what we kept telling ourselves was this cave troll has a wife and kids back home. <laughs> and basically he was, you know, captured by orcs and kind of lured here. And it's like, that's why it's not... Especially because Frodo has already, you know, in inverted commas, died. Um, it's not the, the triumphant moment it maybe should be when they kill the cave troll. It's just kind of like, oh, well, this is kind of a bit sad. You've just you've killed an animal. Like, it was trying to kill you, but also you shouldn't feel great. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, that's worth teasing out as well. It's like one of the first times, in fact, the very not first time Tolkien sits King's down to advance the story beyond the Balin's tomb. To the stabbing of Frodo by yeah, an orc chieftain that stone, seemingly kills him. That's there the very first time. Yeah. It's it's remarkable for someone who's just making it up as he goes Oh, pardon me. As he goes along, how many times he nails it on the first try. Yeah. It's it's interesting how, like, I really like what Jackson did do with that scene of how, you know, the cave troll isn't really a thing and then some random orc throws a spear at Thro Frodo and, like, kills him and makes the whole Mithril thing, like, happen. Like, it's such... I don't know whether I would, you know, necessarily think of it as a, as a writer slash director or whatever, but 
what Jackson did is really natural of like merging those two, making the cave troll more of a thing and have the cave troll like in inverted commas kill Frodo. I think that actually works really well. Yeah, I think so too. And like it means that trolls are a more meaningful place in the narrative because otherwise Tolkien doesn't talk a lot about them other than their brief <laughs> appearance in The Hobbit. <laughs> So there's a fantastic book, which I think I'd probably recommend for you, um, called Notes from Small Planets, which is basically, imagine someone writing like a Lonely Planet style travel guide for like sci-fi and fantasy worlds from like oh, known media. This is it's a, really good. Uh, you give this as a gift to the to Yeah, the to the stag, stag, my right? brother. Um, but like one of one of the best things in it is like one, literally the first one he does is a parody of the whole like Lord of the Rings high fantasy world, um, and he has a whole thing about how no one really spends a lot of time looking at trolls and ogres. They're all just grouped together as in inverted commas the big lads. <laughs> it's just like yeah, that kind of nails Tolkien's view on, well at least what Tolkien shows us about the big lads. <laughs> so I always think of them as 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 that. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm gonna do this again. Are we ready for like um? Oh. What we're talking about the cave trolls? Like, there's a cave troll that plays an unexpected role the first time that Tolkien writes about a Balrog. Oh, so, are the you go on. Are we ready, viewership? Because like I've got here the, the very first time that oh, Tolkien. Shit. Oh shit! I wasn't watching. Yeah, I'm gonna get eaten. Yeah. Oh, that's a shame. I guess you'll be retrying that. Yeah, it's just a. Oh, thanks. Will I be? Uh, yeah, go on. So the very first time that Tolkien writes about the Balrog, the Wizard Kazadun, like, he writes something which I think is actually better than the version of this we get in Fellowship. And weirdly, a cave troll features hugely heavily in the events that occur on the Bridge of Kazadun, at least the first Don't, time aren't Tolkien they, like, place, this. The only thing I remember in the actual finished version is trolls are like placing stones that are going to get let the orcs cross the fire of the bridge or some bullshit yeah, like that. exactly. So in, in Fellowship, like, it's often overlooked, but there's a couple of cave trolls that place like a big brick bridge, like a big yeah. stone bridge, so that the orcs can cross the fire that is rent by the Balrog, or created by the Balrog. But it's a little bit different in the original version, and like, also it's awesome. So, we'll talk about like what I'm about to read in a second, but ahem, I now begin. <laughs> Suddenly, Frodo saw before him a black gulf. Just before the end of the hall, the floor vanished and fell into an abyss. The exit door could not be reached, save by a narrow, railless bridge of stone that spanned the chasm with a single curving leap of some fifty feet. Across it they could only pass in single file. They reached the chasm in a pack and halted at the bridge end for a moment. More arrows whistled over them. One pierced Gandalf's hat and stuck like a black feather. A little, little bit maybe comedic? I'm not sure what the intention is there, but certainly Gandalf takes are an arrow- Are you talking like that sometimes? You're like, are you, are you just- like, why did you describe that? He has brief moments of whimsy, like, it's like yeah, an, arrow, an arrow hitting Gandalf in the hat is strange, but we'll, we'll, we'll proceed. He looks back. Away beyond the fiery fissure, Frodo saw the swarming black figures of many orcs. They brandished spears and scimitars which shone red as blood. Boom, boom, rolled the drumbeats, now advancing louder and louder and more and more menacing. Oh, Two the drums in the deep, you gotta love it. The, the drums in the deep are good. Like, I'm not sure if Fellowship has the boom, boom, like... I think it does, the onomatopoeia for, oh shit, Drums in the Deep, I think it is there. Oh, that's cool. Anyway, it's here in the, this is the earliest draft, this is the earliest version of Bridge of Chasm we get. Oh, Ahem. fuck off you. Sorry, that was it. I'm fucking this up and he was like, ah, don't worry, take your time. Maybe we'll get lucky and the Grog will die of old age. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite funny, actually. Uh, Speaking of whimsy. Yeah. Anyway, two great dark troll figures could be seen towering among the orcs. They strode forward into the fiery brink. Legolas bent his bow, then he let it fall. He gave a cry of dismay and terror. Two great dark troll shapes had appeared, but it was not these that caused his cry. The orc ranks had opened as if they themselves were afraid. A figure strode to the fissure. No more than man high, yet terror seemed to go before it. They could see the furnace fire of its yellow eyes from afar. Its arms were very long. It had a red tongue. Through the air it sprang over the fiery fissure. The flames leaped up to greet it and wreathed about it. Its streaming hair seemed to catch fire, and the sword that it held turned to flame. In its other hand it held a whip of many thongs. <laughs> aye, aye, wailed Legolas. The Balrog is come. Was that an early draft or was that the actual scene as written? Because I that's, that, the, that's the actual scene as written. I was going to oh, say, sorry, yeah. That, that's, that's not from Fellowship. This is the, fr I remember the first I, I, time. I, a Balrog being a thing that he says. And I remember laughing, and as as I did then, at a whip of many thongs, because that's a word. Um, 
But yeah, like... Come on! So I was I was thinking about that while you were kind of reading it. Unfortunately, the description you've given does perfectly accurately describe it fits for the Balrog from the 1978 animated Lord of the Rings. It's strange, Unfortunately, that scene's shit. It is quite shit. It's and like, the Balrog looks like crap, but it's like the fact he was like, oh yeah, not much more than man's height, but it had a whip, its sword was on fire, and its eyes glowed creepily. Like, that describes the beast you see in, in the Bakshi animation. It is, but like, we don't get in the Bakshi animation, or indeed in Jackson's film, but, like, I think a full explanation of the fire leapt up to meet it, and like, wings wreathed in flame. Like, oh, you definitely see that, that scene where it roars when it's actually a tennis ball on fire with the the battle wrong CG'd around it. Yeah, but like, I think it's almost like a too literal demonic sort of thing. Like, I'm pretty sure in Fellowship, See, I really, the I actual really appearance of the Balrog in Fellowship is very ambiguous, whereas here, explicitly, yeah. this is how Tolkien imagined it at first like, attempt. I mean, there's not much there. He doesn't give any actual indication of form and that kind of thing. I think you've got a lot of liberty to work with there. Well, maybe, but we're getting to it. I'll, I'll continue. A Balrog, said Gandalf. What evil fortune, and my power is nearly spent. The fiery figure ran across the floor. The orcs yelled and shot many arrows. Over the bridge, cried Gandalf. Go on, go on. This is a foe beyond any of you. I will hold the bridge. Go on. Now, it's interesting, that very famous line. This foe is beyond any of you. Yeah, like, the version of Lord of the Rings that we're all most familiar with, like, this is the first time Tolkien ever describes this scene, and, like, that single line transcends, like, almost what? If he's writing this in 1940? O almost 80 years of media to make it into the final draft of, like, Jackson's, like, yeah. film, which is, which is kind of remarkable. I do wonder how much... Do, is there any indication that either we've lost Tolkien's drafts, or that he just does a lot of drafting, you know, in his head? Oh, we're definitely lost Cause, stuff. Like, um, because the, the extent to which things, as you say, do seem to emerge seeming fully formed makes me think maybe we have an actual, not super complete picture of his works, or he just does a lot of stuff. Like, he's one of those people, kind of like me. The fucking so the sprite hated me for this while I was writing my PhD oh, thesis. God, so basically, the planning and the like, the the uh, the getting shit ready is the difficult part for me for writing. When it actually comes to like, came to write my thesis. Most of the actual putting pen to paper and getting words written I found actually really easy because I basically have things mostly written in my head by the time I actually come to, in inverted commas, write them. And I wonder the extent to which Tolkien was similar. I think it's actually, it's a good point you make, but it's a combination of both. So yeah, throughout, sure. throughout the history of The Lord of the Rings, Christopher Tolkien takes great pains to point out, he's like, I'm trying to make this out the best I can, but my father, his handwriting's terrible and I can't read this. <laughs> and, and he's also like, uh, clearly... There's a page missing here, and I can't find it, and it's not here in his study, and it's not in Oxford University, and it's not in Marquette University, so we'll never know. Yeah. And and also, like, Tolkien himself gave interviews where, like, there's a very famous thing where he says, oh, the idea came to me after a long bath. <laughs> so, so clearly he was just sitting at home thinking about this and never wrote any of it down. Yeah. Which is, I mean, it's a fair enough way to write, because we got Lord of the Rings, and it's brilliant. Yeah, but I mean, it, it clearly worked. <laughs> Yeah, but but by it's a very pertinent question that you ask because the answer is yeah, we've definitely lost stuff and we'll yeah. never recover it. Now, we'll oh shit, we're about to see Kellerimbo get fucking killed by Sauron. Yeah, we'll, we'll hold off just now, like on yeah. our narrative of the Balrog, but we'll return to it. Let's watch Kellerimbo get messed up by Sauron. Ooh, is Sauron gonna choke him out? What's happening? This is, looks. I think that's the ring on his hand. I imagine that's glowing now. Oh. Fiercely, it's the one. Yeah. Or is he going to use it like a fucking knuckle duck? I mean, death by one ring is a good way to die. I mean, not if it leaves you as, you know, if it leaves you banished from death for however the fuck long. Is this their personal combat? Because as we've spoken about, Celebrimbor is like a fairly minor elven lord in the grand scheme of things. Like, ah, good at he's a grandson of Feanor, he's not exactly minor. Well, but yeah, he's a grandson of like a mighty yeah. elven lord. I mean, he was lord of, not Linden, what the fuck was it called? The big city in a region. Uh, Torst and Ed Lost or some some shit that sounds like that. 